In this video, we're going to learn how to use the impulse momentum theorem to solve problems that relate a changing velocity to force and time. In this problem, the Toyota Prius can go from 0 to 60 miles per hour in 9.7 seconds. We want to know what magnitude of force would cause this acceleration, and we're given the mass of the Prius. Now we could solve this using kinematics equations to find the acceleration, and then using Newton's second law, net force equals mass times acceleration, to find the net force. However, because we're learning about impulse and momentum, we're going to use the impulse momentum theorem instead. The thing that's really nice about that theorem is instead of this problem taking two steps, finding acceleration using kinematics and then finding the force, the impulse momentum theorem combines it all into one. So for starters, let's write out what the impulse momentum theorem is. The impulse momentum theorem tells us that the force times the time is equal to the change in momentum. The force is the thing we're looking for in this case. So force is equal to the change in momentum divided by the change in time. Anytime we're trying to find a change in something, we always do it by doing final minus initial divided by time. Now momentum is defined as being mass times velocity. So the final momentum is the mass times the final velocity minus the mass times the initial velocity, all divided by time. You'll notice I'm not using vector symbols here. That's on purpose, because we're looking for the magnitude of the force, and so we're using magnitudes of our variables here. Now, it tells me that the car is going from 0 to 60, so my initial velocity is 0. That means the initial momentum is also 0. So to find the force, I simply need to do the mass of the Prius, 1,325 kilograms, times its final velocity in meters per second, since I'll be doing force in newtons, so 26.8 meters per second, divided by the amount of time it takes, which is 9.7 seconds. Plug that all into a calculator, and you should get, with proper sig figs, 3,700 newtons. In this second problem, we have Maley hitting a softball. Uh, it's a 171 gram softball that is coming toward her at 96.5 kilometers per hour. Maley, being the rock star softball player that she is, hits the ball for a line drive, and the ball leaves her back horizontally with a speed of 103 kilometers per hour. In part A, we're asked to find the impulse of the softball. So we know that impulse is defined as being the force times the time. However, we also know that this is equal to the change in momentum. We don't know force or time yet, so we're going to have to go the route of finding the change in momentum to be able to find the impulse. Well, anytime we're finding the change in something, it's always the final minus the initial. And we know that impulse, or sorry, that momentum is mass times velocity. So this is mass times final velocity minus mass times initial velocity. We know the mass is 171 grams, but to have the correct units, we must convert that to kilograms. In kilograms, the mass is 0 0.171. And since that is common in both of the two terms, I'm just going to factor it out, just to make for less writing. My final velocity is 103 kilometers per hour, but of course I must convert that to meters per second. So in meters per second, that's equal to 28.6. Now, the ball is traveling toward Maley at 96.5 kilometers per hour. Of course, I have to convert that as well, and that ends up being 26.8 meters per second. But there's one mistake we've made here. We forgot to account for direction, because when that ball is traveling toward Maley, it's going in an opposite direction as it is when it's traveling away from Maley. 
So I need to make sure that these two velocities have different signs to indicate that they're in opposite directions. I'll make the 26.8 negative. So when we have minus a negative, that ends up being plus a positive. Those two signs kind of cancel each other out in some way. So I can do all this nice multiplication. And I end up finding that the impulse delivered to the ball is equal to 9.48. And of course the units, kilograms, meters per second. You could also use the, Newtons, the units of Newton seconds for impulse. In part B, we're asked with what force Maley hit the softball, assuming that the ball is in contact with the bat for 0.13 seconds. Here's where we use the impulse momentum theorem, or the fact that the force times time is equal to the change in momentum. We already know the change in momentum, and so we simply need to divide this change in momentum, 9.48 kilograms meters per second, by that time of 0.13 seconds. Let's write that out. So change in momentum is equal to force times time. And so the force is equal to that change in momentum divided by time, or 9.48 kilogram meters per second divided by 0.13 seconds. When I do that division, I end up finding that the force that Maley delivers to the ball is equal to 72.9 newtons. Now, it didn't say magnitude of the force, it said with what force, so that means we need a direction with this force. Now, because we're not given a whole lot of information about direction in the problem, I can simply say with this direction, um, I'm going to say toward the outfield. That seems to make some sense. That's the way you would typically hit a ball, especially if it's leaving your bat horizontally. So this gives us an idea of how we can calculate impulse and momentum. Let's look at the third problem. In our final problem, Sarah is accidentally throwing her iPhone around, and the iPhone hits the wall at an angle of 60 degrees and then bounces off the wall also at an angle of 60 degrees. We want to know what the average force is exerted on the phone. Before I start actually doing the math for this problem, I'm going to draw a diagram, not necessarily showing the phone, but showing those velocity vectors. So let's say that this is the wall, and the phone is traveling toward the wall, and it says that it makes a 60 degree angle with the wall, so there's my 60 degrees here, and it was traveling at 5.2 meters per second. and then bounces off the wall at that same angle of 60 degrees, but this time it's going a bit slower, 4.4 meters per second. Sarah really should be more careful with her phone, obviously. Um, so this problem's a little bit different than the last two. The last two we were dealing with um, vectors that were, horizontal, or that were parallel to each other. Um, but this time we have some angles thrown in here. So we're going to look at this impulse momentum theorem and how we deal with it when we have angles. First of all, the impulse momentum theorem tells us that the force times the time is equal to the change in momentum. Now, there's a couple of different ways to approach this, but the way that I think is the easiest is to split this equation up into its components. In other words, I'm finding the x component of the force times time is equal to the x component of the change of momentum. And I'll do the exact same thing in the y direction in a few minutes.
So that means that the x component of the force is equal to the change in the x components of the momentum divided by time. So we have the final momentum, x component, which is mass times the final velocity, x component, minus mass times the initial velocity, x component, all divided by time. Okay, I think I probably have enough down that I can start plugging some numbers in here. So my x component of my force is equal to, my mass it tells me is 112 grams. I of course have to convert that. So 0.112 kilograms. And just as I did before, I'm gonna pull that out of my equation here. My final velocity overall is 4.4 meters per second, and that makes a 60 degree angle with the wall. And so to find its x component, I'll do 4.40 meters per second. And the x component would be opposite of this angle. I'm gonna draw my components in on my diagram up here. So there's the y component. And there's my x component, approximately. And so we see that that x component is opposite of the 60 degrees. And when we have opposite, we use sine. So 4.40 times the sine of 60 degrees. And that is a component that is pointed to the left. And since it's pointed to the left, based on my drawing, I will make sure that that is a negative value. And then we subtract the uh, x component of my initial velocity vector. So again, I'm going to draw those components in on my diagram. The x component would be pointed to the right here, and the y component pointed up. So since it's pointed to the right, it's positive, and I could find it by doing 5.20 meters per second times, once again, the sine of 60 degrees based on the fact that it is the opposite component. I divide all of that by my time. Now the problem tells me the time in milliseconds, 15 milliseconds. Converting that to just plain old seconds, I have 0 0.015 seconds. I get to plug all of that into my calculator, of course making sure the calculator is in degree mode, and I end up getting a force equal to negative 62.1 newtons. The negative sign should make some sense to you because it makes some sense that this force is pointed in the left word, or at least has a left component to it. But we also need to find its y component. So in finding the y component, we're going to do basically the exact same thing. The only difference is that instead of using sine functions, we're going to be using cosine because that y component is adjacent to the angle in each case. We'll also have to pay some attention to the direction. So this time, I want you to try calculating that component yourself and pause the video while you're doing so. When you unpause the video, I'll talk about what the component is and how to finish off the problem. You should have found the y component to be negative 2.99 newtons. Negative shows that it's downward, which again makes some sense because the y component of the initial velocity is larger than the y component of the final velocity. So I now have an x and y component for my force. I have to find the overall force, and I can do that by just combining these x and y components as we learned to do when we learned about vectors. If I draw that x component, it goes to the left, and it's rather long, 62.1 newtons, as opposed to the y component, which goes downward and is rather short. My overall vector looks something like that, and we know that we can use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for that force value, and then also use trig functions to solve for the angle. Again, pause the video and do that for yourself right now. You should have found the overall force
to be 62.2 newtons at an angle of 87.2 degrees south of west or below the negative x-axis. So you found through these three videos hopefully that we can use the impulse momentum theorem to relate a changing velocity to the force that is applied and the amount of time for which that force is applied.